Hi folks, Matt Easton here and I am at Olympia Auctions and that's because there's an amazing sale coming up on the 26th of June and I'm here to peruse and handle and talk about some of the amazing things in the upcoming sale which include two Castillon swords and hopefully by now you've seen the first video in this series talking about those two incredible Castillon long swords. But now we're going to be looking at some medieval and renaissance or early renaissance daggers. Now, you will know if you've been watching my videos for any uh, number of years that there were a number of very popular and very uh, universal types of dagger in use in the military sphere in the late medieval and early renaissance periods. The first type, which first appears really in the 13th century, we could say with any, um, any frequency, if we look at something like the Morgan Bible or Makiowski Bible, we see something which sometimes is referred to as a quillon dagger. And it's a bit like a miniature sword. And we have an example here. So this is the first dagger we're gonna look at. And this is in the sale, it is lot 136. And it is a small and rather dainty, it's about the size of a Fairbairn Sykes actually, maybe, yeah, about the size, maybe a tiny bit bigger than a Fairbairn Sykes. And you'll notice that it is very much like a small sword. It has a pommel, a grip, this is a replacement grip, a cross guard, and a blade. Now the blade, as you'll see, is very similar to a Febin Sykes. It's, it's um, approximately the same length, it's double-edged, and it has a mid-rib. It is probably a little bit thicker than a Febin Sykes, but of course the primary purpose of these daggers and the reason that they started to become popular as backups to the sword, um, so a kind of tertiary weapon, if we consider the primary weapon being a lance or a pole axe or something like that, is the Quillon dagger was a backup to the sword, particularly in grappling range if you're fighting against an armoured opponent. And really that's what it's all about. There was a period of time where daggers and knives don't seem to have really been carried by knights in the age of mail, but once we start to get plate coming in, like the coat of plates and the first limb defences made of plate, we start to see the rise of daggers and that's almost certainly because knights were becoming harder and harder to kill and so uh, if you got into grappling distance um, a very very close range with an opponent you needed something like this to jam into their armpit or the slit of their helmet or um, under the, uh, the skirts of their armor um, to finish them off or incapacitate them or potentially even take them prisoner because of course remember that ransoming high status opponents was very much a feature of this period as well. So these types of daggers, quillon daggers, start to come around. Now this particular example features a um, copper alloy, should we call it brass or bronze, something like this. We don't know the, I don't know the exact composition. A little wheel pommel there, much like you'd find on a sword, and it's got a little uh, peen on the end there. We just, there we go. And you'll notice it got, has got the remnants of some heraldic motif on each face of the pommel. The wooden grip is a uh, replacement to make it more um, handleable, I guess, and make it more presentable. And the little cross guard, you'll notice it's made of the same alloy as the pommel with little dropped terminal ends there, um, which really give a really nice balanced feel uh, to this rather dainty little quillon dagger. Now, I think sometimes when people look at medieval manuscripts or effigies in churches and cathedrals, they think that these daggers were big objects, but actually they didn't need to be, because remember, if you're rolling around on the floor with an enemy knight, you don't need a particularly big blade to jam into uh, some gap that you can find. So this is just big enough, much like a commando dagger or Feb and Sykes, um, and a really lovely first dagger that really is one of the first types of knightly dagger specific to war and specifically carried by knights that we see on the battlefield. This example probably dates to the late 14th century. Now, another really popular and successful medieval dagger design that came about around the same time, actually, as the Quillon dagger is known as the Basilard. Now, in the Basilard's case, we have a cross guard, but we also have a pommel, which is a bit like a repeat of the cross guard. In other words, it's like a capital I shape, or H, depending which way you look at it. And actually, we see some early examples of these in 13th century art, but they really became super popular in the 14th century. And here we've got a potentially 14th, maybe early 15th century example of a Basilard. This one's probably Swiss. Now, a strange feature of the Basilard, which was a very popular design, but only in specific areas. Now, not to say you didn't find Basilards in France or Spain or um, the, the Holy Roman Empire, but the fact is that Basilards were most popular for some reason, reasons we don't exactly know why, in Switzerland, possibly where the name 
from Basel, uh, comes from Basilard, but also in Italy and in England. Uh, we don't exactly know why they were so popular in Italy and England. It's possible that they became popular in Italy, copied from the Swiss, and then the Italian merchants, who were very prevalent in London particularly, but all English cities at the time in the late 14th century, brought them as daggers and people bought them. And they were carried as civilian as well as military daggers. So many of these were carried in civilian life. And in fact, when we look at effigies and brasses of notable people, people who could afford to have tombs, uh, we can see that they're very often wearing basilards in England, also in Italy, but in England, they're often wearing basilards. So sometimes someone might wear another type of dagger in military life, and, but they'd wear a basilard in civilian life. And we even know that civilians who didn't have any military involvement whatsoever took to wearing basilards around town. It wasn't legal for most commoners who weren't knights to wear swords in English cities, so they took to wearing basilards, and in some cases, the biggest basilards they could possibly lay their hands on. And some basilards are sword-sized. They're actually as big as a, a falchion, actually. And in fact, in Switzerland, we even have a treatise teaching us about the use of the basilard as a short sword, and the techniques are very similar to the messa, so very comparable with a falchion or a messa. However, this is the dagger variety, and this is the type that would have been carried uh, possibly in civilian or military life. Now, if we just look at its features for a second, you will notice it has a double fillered blade, and this is something that we find quite commonly on basilards. For some reason, this type of blade, double-edged, double fuller for the first half of the blade, is a very common type of blade for basilards, for some reason. Then the tang is essentially forged into an eye shape. But here's an important detail. We'll notice that it is actually a hidden tang. So running around the edge of here, we actually have, try and get the focus in there, we actually have a brass strap. Okay, that runs all the way around the end. And obviously we find that on things like later Bowie knives, but we also find it in the 16th, late 15th and 16th centuries with things like the Cinque Dea as well. So just because a tang is the shape of the grip, don't think that necessarily the tang is exposed at the sides. Very often it's covered up with a strap like this. Uh, in this case, this would have been, obviously now it's got patina, but originally it would have been bright gold colored. And in conjunction with that, we also have these decorative rivets running through the grip, as you can see there, that have a, a tube-like structure, so they are hollow all the way through and go through to the other side. And the grip scales themselves, in this case, seem to be made of, um, seem to be made of antler. Um, now, that's quite interesting, actually, because most of the ones that I've seen have been wood, you occasionally find them of other materials, but most seem to be made of wood. So the fact that this is made of what appears to be um, stag antler by the look of it is actually very, very interesting to me. So this is a remarkable survival um, of a type of dagger, obviously very, very rare to find now, and it's amazing that it's coming up for auction and um, anybody could, uh, could own this um, now. But originally, these would be incredibly common, and just about any civilian man who could afford a knife would have walked around town wearing one of these in England or Switzerland or Italy. Now, as far as military daggers are concerned, as we go towards the latter half of the 14th century, we start to find a specialized type of dagger, which regular viewers of my channel will know only too well as the rondel dagger. I've talked a lot about rondel daggers. We even, in fact, know exactly how they fought with rondel daggers because we've got treatises telling us how to defend against attacks from one and how to use one, both out of armor in a civilian self-defense environment and also in a military environment. And that's very important to remember, of course, that just because a military weapon is made for military activities doesn't mean that it wasn't also carried in the street because at this time they often were. And in fact, the divide between civilian and military weapons wasn't as stark in this period. So in the later half of the 14th century, because knights are starting to be fully plate armored and the gaps uh, are fewer uh, to find where you can actually stick a dagger, we start to get these fairly, or partly because of that, we get these very specialized rondel daggers. Now a rondel dagger is called that because it has rondels. That means round things. Sometimes it's just the round guard. In this case, it's a round pommel and a round guard, and that's fairly common. However, not all of them have the disc-like pommel. Um, some of them have a, like a little ball pommel or uh, almost even a fishtail pommel. So the pommels can vary, you don't always have. But in this case, and this is, this is a fairly popular design type, 
the disc at top and bottom are pretty much identical size and shape. Now obviously the grip is missing because this is a late 14th or early 15th century rondel dagger and whatever grip material was on there was obviously organic so it would have been probably wood but it could have been something like horn or even bone and that has long rotted away. So we're left with the um, iron components or steel components and it should be noted this is a fairly small grip. Um, now one thing I did say when I was first looking at this I was like well my hand doesn't fit inside that grip however from looking at art and looking at surviving grips on some other rondel daggers, we do know that some of these grips were almost as wide as the discs themselves. So while you see a little tang now, originally the grip would have been much wider. And in that case, it is entirely possible for me to grip the whole thing where the guard and the pommel becomes part essentially of the handle or grip. Okay. So once again, we don't know what the grip was like. It might have been thin, it might have been thick, it might have had a spiral groove, which was quite popular at the time, we just don't know. An important thing to note about these discs is they are not solid metal and almost never are when they are thick like this. So when you see a rondel dagger in a museum or in an auction or in medieval artwork, if they are thick, they are almost always hollow as these are. So essentially these are made like a small box. We have a disc on the top and bottom. You can actually see the disc has come slightly uh, detached there. This is lot 134, incidentally, in case you didn't see that label. So that we've got a disc here, a disc here, and then a strip going around. Sometimes it seems that they used to fill that uh, sort of drum shape, that box, with a material such as pitch, uh, sometimes possibly with wood or horn or things like that, and sometimes they're just completely hollow and they're brazed around the edge. So usually the sheet steel is usually attached via brazing, so uh, molten brass essentially, or copper alloy. Um, this one is all in one piece, so the discs haven't come uh, detached. And actually an interesting detail, you'll notice that with these, there is no peen or rivet at the end here. So you can't see the tang coming all the way through to the end. And the reason for that is the way they make it is they actually peen against that disc in there. So it's riveted and then the rest of the drum is constructed around that. So the rivet is inside here and we can't see it. Last interesting thing to say about this rondel dagger is that the blade is actually hollow ground flattened diamond section. That is, it's double edged. Now, while that type of blade was always available for rondel daggers, over time, it wasn't the predominant type of blade found on rondel daggers. Usually rondel dagger blades became single-edged or triangular, even sometimes square. So they became more specialized for punching through armor, specifically male, and to some extent the fabric that was worn underneath armor as well. This being a narrow double-edged and fairly simple double-edged blade, suggests that it's an earlier form of rondel dagger. But we can't be 100% sure, but um, generally speaking, these simple double-edged blades tend to be earlier rondel daggers, and later rondel daggers become more and more specialized. Now, we're gonna jump forward in time a little bit to the early 16th century, so the very beginning of the 1500s now, but we're gonna stick with the rondel dagger theme based on what I was just telling you, because it really illustrates the point well. So what we've got here is an early 16th century rondel dagger, and you'll notice this actually has a a wood I believe it is or is it horn uh, maybe it's maybe it's horn yeah I think that might be horn so you've got a horn grip and pommel and a horn guard but it is undeniably still a rondel dagger it's recognizable as a rondel dagger so there we go and it fits in my hand really comfortably it's like it was made for me okay so that grips not too small for me at all and there are a few interesting differences with this particular one compared to the other one. First of all, this is more ornate, should we say. So the butt cap, if we call it that, there we go, is a decorative brass disc on the end here. And you can, in this case, see the end of the tang being peened through there. And it's really, really, really attractive um, thing. There we go. Okay, it's got a relatively simple uh, tubular grip or a cylindrical grip, should we say. And now the guard. This is an interesting feature of later, mostly of later rondel daggers. And the rondel, in other words, the guard bit, which isn't really to protect your hand from an opponent's weapon, it's to protect your hand from sliding onto the blade. But you will notice it is now asymmetrical. Okay, so it sticks out on one side, the side where your hand would predominantly be, but not the other side. And that, um, 
is essentially for more comfortable wear. It means that by cutting away at the side, much like later 19th century sabers, the guard extends more on one side than the other, so that when you're wearing it against your body, wherever you're wearing it, that doesn't dig into your ribs or your hip, wherever you're wearing it, and it's more comfortable to wear. So the guard only projects on one side. And remember, that guard isn't really to protect your hand from an opponent's weapon, it's to protect your hand from sliding onto the blade when you jam it into something. Now finally the blade, it shows the more specialized blade that I was just talking about. The first thing to say about it is, it is triangular. So you'll notice on one side it has a mid rib running down here, middle of the blade here, so it is double edged. But on the back side it is flat. So it is a triangle, you could lay it flat on a table like that and you've got uh, like a, a little pyramid sticking up here and flat on the side there. So first of all it's triangular. Why is it triangular? Well one of the advantages of a triangle is it makes it incredibly stiff. Okay, you could say in some ways, is it easier to make? I don't know. Um, I think it probably is slightly easier to make, but I don't think that's why they did it. We find triangular blades very often on specialized thrusting weapons. S-stocks, small swords, bayonets, socket bayonets. So triangular blades, very, very good for stabbing and for thrusting, which is of course what a rondel dagger is for. And you'll also notice, this is very also typical of the early 16th century, the base of the blade there has some engraving on it. And we find engraving on the ricassos and bases of blades on swords and daggers, particularly around the year 1500 and through to 1550. It's very common early 16th century thing. And the final thing to say about this rondel dagger is it has a reinforced tip. So, you could just have a blade that tapers to a really sharp point and it would be great for stabbing, but the problem is we're living in an age where what you might be stabbing into might be mail, aka chain mail, or it might be a jack, or jack of plates, or a brigandine. So if you're stabbing into something that's very tough and very strong like this, what you don't want is a very thin tip like we might find on something like a small sword, because the tip will snap off. If your tip snaps off, you no longer have an effective dagger. You now have a blunt dagger. So what we have here is a reinforced tip where you can see it swells and gets thicker right at the end there. So a triangular blade with almost a cylindrical swollen tip uh, to reinforce that point, put more metal behind that tip and make it stronger as well as more effective at its job. Now to finish off, no video talking about late medieval or early renaissance daggers could be complete without talking about bollocks. In this case, a bollock dagger. And this is one of the most popular types of dagger that we find throughout the 15th century. They first appear probably in the late 14th century, in fact. We don't really know how, we don't really know the origin of them, we don't know where they started, but suddenly before we know it, uh, when we get into sort of the first or second quarter of the 15th century, we suddenly find bollock daggers everywhere. And there are low status ones, there are high status ones, and they continued all the way into the 16th century. In fact, in the 16th century, in 1545, the Mary Rose sunk, and we have dozens and dozens and dozens of bollock dagger hilts, because the metal doesn't survive in most pipe cases, but we have the organic hilts surviving because it was under the sea. We have loads and loads and loads of those bollock dagger hilts surviving from 1545. So they were still really popular in the middle of the 16th century. And in fact, they also provide the prototype and the basis for the Highland Dirk. And actually, if you look at early Highland Scottish Dirks, you'll see they follow the general outline and shape of a bollock dagger. And in fact, in the decoration of some Highland, later, later period Highland Dirks, you actually can still see the outlines of the two um, kind of balls here on the dagger. Right, so this is possibly late 15th century, possibly early 16th century. It's difficult to tell with bollock daggers because the designs of them can stay quite the same for quite periods of time and it varies in different places. So not knowing necessarily the history of this or where it came from exactly, it's difficult to date it precisely, but it, it, would, it would feature in the late Wars of the Roses or it could feature in the early Tudor period as well. So the um, grip is made of wood. It's simple. It's just essentially a tubular shape of wood. It's got a slightly raised um, sort of rim around the uh, top of the pommel there. Um, and it has the two little spherical objects here just below the guard. And an interesting detail that you can just about see is these pins, these iron pins coming up here through those. And that is actually quite a common feature in the construction of these. And very often 
those pins will come up and secure the guard to the balls, as it were, of the, uh, of the hilt. And then we've got this reinforced sort of brass element. And this is something really that we, helps us date these. So that's, what, that's why this has been dated to the late 15th century. So it's got a sort of lines running around it, and it's got a decorative element uh, to the... Um, I don't know what you want to call it. It's not really a guard. It's more of a, it's more of a sort of, um, it's almost like a habaki actually on a Japanese sword. Um, right, the blade. So the blade, very often on these um, bullock daggers, the blades are single edged. And that's really important because these are often associated with people of lower status than things like rondel daggers. So the fact that it's a single edged blade means that it could potentially be used as a tool um, more easily than a double edged blade because we commonly associate double edged blades with weapon, single edged blade, tool. So possibly, but possibly not because there are lots of weapons with single edged blades as well. But nevertheless, it is a thick backed single edged blade. They are cheaper to make and easier and quicker to make than double edged blades. It is slightly hollow ground. Obviously, it's lost a lot of its edge and it's lost its very tip. But I can feel with my fingers that there is a degree of hollow grinding. So although we've got a thick spine all the way down here, it does hollow in and you have a hollow ground edge. So it would have had a very sharp edge on it originally. And it's, again, it's not particularly long. It's about the same length as a Fairbairn Sykes dagger. It's not a big object, but it's big enough for what's required. Anyway, I hope that's been a useful and interesting whistle-stop tour through some original examples of late medieval and early renaissance daggers um, european of course and they are featured in um, the upcoming sale 26th of june at olympia auctions and i'm absolutely stoked to be able to show those to you here original examples of medieval daggers that i've spoken about in so many videos what a great experience thanks for watching i hope i'll see you for my next video as well cheers folks